Party Girls do for fun. Fun? Uh... Howdy, everyone. Welcome to Unsafe Space Book Club. I'm Carter. Carrie's around here somewhere. There she Carter, is. Carter. And Tiger. Oh, Howdy. Yeah, sure. How are you doing? Good. How are you? How's Tiger? He's excellent. This is his favorite book. That's why he came. <laughs> <laughs> he Did he like it? He enjoyed it. Excellent. <laughs> um, well, book club, we do one, about once a month. This is the book. Uh, where it is? There you go. Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Uh, and oh, yeah, we're going to talk about it. Yeah. And other people are going to be here. <laughs> so there they are. Hey, welcome, Manny, guys. Uh, looks like he's already angry about the book. So, um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, maybe should we kick off with like, Carrie, do you want to, what are your impressions? Because I, I had read this before. Is this, the, but this isn't the first time you read it either, right? I read this in school. Uh, I don't remember what grade, but sometime in high school, and I didn't remember very much about it. So it was great to read it now. I can't even imagine what I thought about it then. Um, mm -hmm. But my my takeaway is this is the most Christian book I think we've ever read for book club, even more than the wow. C.S. Lewis book. <laughs> wow. So, well, I love it. So there yeah. you go. Are we, um, <laughs> secretly a Christian no file. Appreciate it. That. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I think it's Sandro's first time in book club. Am I correct? Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey, yes. And this is his, he said, a very meaningful book for him. So I, I, I don't, I'm going to put him on the spot and ask him to tell us a little bit about what he loves about it. No, I read it when I was 16 and uh, it's not a book to read in high school. Definitely. It's a book to read when you're 30. Uh, so it marked me deeply. That's uh, that's the reason pretty much. And I wanted to be on TV. No. <laughs> well, did it, could you relate? Cause you were out killing old ladies and this book really, is that how it spoke to you, or is there some other reason? <laughs> well, I'm I'm from Cuba. My my aunt, I had an aunt uh, who uh, would sleep and take naps with me, and she would tell me uh, all the stories of all the books she were she was telling uh, she was reading, uh, all classical literature. And uh, one of the ones that impressed me was Crime and Punishment. And then I moved to the Dominican Republic from I'm from Cuba. Uh, and when I was about 16, I wanted to look to read like grown-up brainy books and uh, I chose that particular one and it was um, it was a it was a brick and uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks and and there's a lot of meaning uh, and a lot of uh, layers to the book I think Dostoevsky is uh, um, it's not simple he's a complex writer uh, and many of the things that happen you have to do with Russian and have to you have to look at the translation and so on. And uh, I just found her, I just in, in a way after I read the book, I became Raskolnikov in a way because I had a, a hard life. I lived in New York. I, I cannot be on his spot. I didn't kill any old lady though. Uh, but yeah, it affected me deeply in a way. What, uh, I don't know, any other first comments from people in in chat here? Alex, I know you love it. This was my first time, and uh, my, my university didn't do a lot of Russian uh, literature, which I th always thought was kind of a tragedy. I, like, read a lot of South American literature, which is unusual, but, yeah, we didn't do a lot of Russian. Like, we did parts of notes from the underground and stuff like that, like, some short stories, Gogol's The Nose, which I love. But then, so I, this was on my list of classics to read. So when you guys picked it, I was really excited because I was like, finally. And um, I, it was funny too, because I brought it up to my friend and he goes that everyone in this book club is everyone who's ever read this novel at this point in the 21st century, because it's not one a lot of people <laughs> end up reading. And um, 
it was funny though because I had no idea what this book was about, like none, because I don't usually read like uh, reviews or uh, like back covers to books before I, I read the book. Um, I, I don't like doing that to myself because I, I, it can set up poor expectations. But it, there was a point when he does murder the the two old ladies, you know, my I I a memory like light bulb went off in my head because I was like, someone told me about this scene. I remember this. That's that he kills one of them with the blunt side, the you know, the mean, cruel one, and he kills the nice one that everybody likes with the sharp side to make it quicker. And it's like it, that's that's how they explained it to me. And I was like, reading it i thought i don't know that he had that kind of co conscious level of decision making in that scene because <laughs> he was kind of insane at that point but i enjoyed it i really enjoyed it um like i know that the the language is a little dense that it's a lot about like you don't know exactly what is the purpose of most of what's going on with it but i i felt like it it held my attention but like i was like rostonikov is like basically insane the whole way through, which actually was kind of fun for me to, to like try to see him rationalize everything he's doing and then his irrational reactions to everything. I really enjoyed it. So I, I, maybe that's weird because I, I don't think a lot of people do like this book. Really? That's one I, of the I, things I love about it is that it's like how Dostoevsky can portray insanity in such a way that's like, Wow, this guy is like falling apart, and I—it's hard to show, not tell, falling apart. But he does, <laughs> and he like does. you totally, you totally get the falling apart. Well, yeah. and then it's not just that it's that it's a, a realistic falling apart, and and that he does it, It's such a realistic falling apart, and there's never any point where he has to say that he's going insane. Like you said, like it's just obvious the whole way through that he's losing his freaking mind and it, but it's in a way that like from the outside like from the character the other character's perspective you couldn't necessarily notice ne and but that's still believable it's still believable oh he just got sick you know they yeah. just think he's delirious with fever sometimes and and you know they don't completely understand how illness works so i was like this whole way through, there's so much realistic quality to the insanity of it. And that's what I liked the most, I guess. I, I, uh, I, I agree. I think that they, they did a great job of showing him falling apart, but also, I don't know. I have so many thoughts about it. One, one it, for me, it's a story of a person who separates himself from the rest of society through this evil act and and does it or says he does it because he believes he's sort of separate and distinct from the rest of humanity that he's like special and superhuman and can be um and can break the moral code that everybody else has to follow but i think and then what he finds when he breaks that moral code and and this is what's relatable to me is it, no matter what that moral code is once you've broken it if you're not a person who's personality disordered <laughs> i think you're going to be eaten up with guilt like he is eventually no it may take a while but <laughs> you can't live with it and and he can't, he can't live with it and so even though he continues he's like of two minds then he becomes separated from the rest of people it's, it talks about how when he's walking to the water i think it's when he was going to throw the stuff away or maybe after he buried it under the rock, but he was like, everybody he was seeing coming into contact with, he, he had an immediate revulsion for everyone and no reason to talk to them and just this disgust with humanity. And, and I think it was like, he really, once you've committed that immoral act, you've set yourself apart. You really have set yourself apart from the rest of society. You've created this chasm that you can't cross unless you confess and 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 you know confess what you did and at first he tries to prevent doing that you know he's like hiding evidence he's really like i'm not going to confess i'm going to live with this thing i'm going to bury it deep down and live with this thing and 
and then and you see this internal it's like a, a, a story of an internal struggle in this man of of can i really live with this and, and justifying it continually justifying what he's done but then having the compulsion to confess and fighting that compulsion repeatedly throughout the story um that was just fascinating to me and it it really even though i don't it's not in the original language. I bet it was even better in the original if Russian, uh, you know, because when you're translating it, you're losing something in the language. But it it's bringing you, it brought me along with it in terms of the emotions and the feelings and the disgust and the sweatiness and everything. <laughs> so I have more yeah. thoughts, but that's my first off. Yeah, there's there's two things that I've heard so far, like the Carrie, what you mentioned about him being revulsed by humanity. Um, I think I don't think that was a consequence of the murder. I think that intensified it. But early on, um, he talked about being or the narrator, I think, talked about um, I hate saying the name, so I'll just say Rody. Rody being a hypochondriac. And very often, I think people call themselves hypochondriacs when really they just don't want to touch or get involved with other people because there's something that they just don't like about humanity. And I think he was already starting to go there and the murder um, actually pushed him a little bit further in that direction. Not necessarily, well, I think he, him hating other humans is really hating himself. And he began to hate himself even more as he realized he couldn't reason and logic himself out of the action that he took. And I've heard the word insane used a couple of times so far. And, and I think it depends on what we mean by going insane. And right. I, I think it's, it's not that he's insane like in a clinical sense. Um, and I think it's important not to mix up his inability to rationalize an evil act and suffering from those consequences as insanity because then it's easy to say well you know you, you commit a murder and you go insane um but i think it's it's better applicable to ourselves and anybody else if you kind of don't if you don't go down that path and think, well, he's kind of going insane and going crazy, but that's what happens to a rational person if they step across that line mm -hmm. and then try to rationalize themselves out of values, which they themselves don't create. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I, a, good, I think that's a good distinction um, that it's not necessarily insanity. I mean, I, one I guess one thing that I I wonder about, like I, I did he did he really think he was in that category of Napoleons, or was this a test to see if he was in the category of Napoleons and he learned that he wasn't? Like Napoleons are psychopaths, right? So they, like they do that and don't regret it. Maybe is is what his conception of the universe was. Like oh, there are these people that do this and. They succeed because even up until almost the end, he still like even when he was in prison, he still had yeah. this idea that it was a failure in execution, not a moral failure. Yeah. Um, and, yeah so, I, and that took a long time to, for, to come out. Right. I, I think, you know, he runs this experiment. So he gets drunk on this idea that he can be above morality and, and he runs the experiment to see whether he can really. Um, you know, avoid all the scruples, compunction, guilt, all of that. And in a way, it works for him. Like it, other people who eventually find out and, you know, the whole thing comes to the surface. I mean, everybody can see, you know, he butchered two innocent people in a, such a brutal way. And he never felt any guilt. He just blamed himself for making mistakes and how, you know, he wasn't, why did he do this? Or how stupid I was, was I to do something else? Or why did I go there? He never feels that just absolutely, he's never haunted by the, the brutality of what he did. Like you said, almost to the very end. And even at the very end, when, you know, it's supposed to be a redemptive um, episode, um, it's, it's as if something throws him at the feet of Sonia. And 
he will maybe adopt the morals that she has. You'll just have to see. Like these might be something that that's going to work better than what the experiment I ran. But he never works it really out for himself why it was right and wrong, and and it's just a, such a masterful dissection of a psychopathic mind. Um, it's just most unlikable character in in any book I've ever read. Like he's just thoroughly repulsive all the way to the end to me and uh, it's just i i can't it was frustrating to read um uh, but he does it brilliantly well I, hopefully you can hear me okay can you hear me yes i'm unfortunately i have had a little snafu at home and so i have to uh come from outside but uh yeah i thought that the book was great and many of the points that you're making i i agree with all of them i think that what actually made him feel guilty was not the killing of the pawnbroker lady, but the the, the, the daughter, right? <laughs> she, he thought that she was innocent and that he ended up killing her is what really made his conscience sort of, that's where he started feeling guilty about it. And then you, it was all back and forth between, you know, uh, his guilty conscience making him or letting him leading him to the point where he's he had he feels he has to confess because he knew that he had done something very wrong now he, i don't think he actually believed that he did wrong with the older lady uh for whatever reason it's like the uh, he was going by the the end justifies the means sort of philosophy right like oh yeah she's a terrible lady so she's better off being killed and the world's gonna be better because it's not here yeah, I and mean, that's what the he arbiter, thinking, right? But it's, it, it, but in the end, it was a bad thing what he did. He murdered a, a, the lady, and, um, and that was what led him to, to uh, have his conscience sort of lead him to to uh, confess. But it was very interesting because the other thing I noted about the book was that because we're in his head the whole time, and the murder starts or the the, the killing starts towards the beginning of the book you sort of forget to a certain degree what happened and the horrible person that he was, like you're saying, the horrible deed that he did, you still feel like some empathy for him and you don't, you know, with all the challenges he's going through, with all the problems he had, the poverty, his, his problem with his, with, you know, being away from his family or his mom and his sister and everything he's going through. And, you know, at a certain point, he was pretty generous too, in many cases. When there was somebody who needed something, he was generous. I mean, he would help people. But you you didn't like him obviously. <laughs> no, he, he, did he doesn't people. even he know why he did it. From, he didn't have anything, and he would give people money when something bad happened. So yeah, but had, it, it it wasn't even his money. He I just know. gave it away, and then he thought, "Well, why did I do that? What a stupid thing to do!" Like I don't even it, understand why I did that. Um, so it's just like <laughs> he is so above the world that n there are no human feelings. Really, that he has no feelings. It's just so self-absorbed, you know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> he, he does have feelings, I don't think. I don't think he's a sociopath or a psychopath or anything like that. I think he's a, a rather um, bourgeois character come to less. And I think the, the proper scientific set terminology for what he's suffering is, uh, is somebody who's high on his own supply, uh, like Scarface, you know. And... Uh, um, Dostoevsky wants you to inhabit that character and be that character because you can too uh, be in that situation at some point. And it's what Jordan Peterson says about Nazis that uh, you are the Nazi. Uh, you don't know mm -hmm. uh, how far you can go until you bring look into the shadow. And I think that's the whole point of yeah. Dostoevsky. Also, uh, yeah. there's something very interesting I was watching videos and stuff about the, the book because I, I read it when I was 16 years old. And I found out that uh, Rodia means schism. And um, again, I don't speak Russian. Uh, and Raskolnikov means, on the other hand, uh, like follower, faithful follower of the, of the Orthodox Church. And the schism, uh, in that moment, he said that the, like today in a way, uh, there is a schism on the, on the uh, Russian society where people were very faithful uh, before that time, but now the ideas of enlightenment uh, are changing the, the picture for uh, 
urban uh, intellectual uh, bourgeois people like Raskolnikov. So they started to question the the whole meaning of the life and the whole narrative of the of the life uh, under a new light that is deprived from faith and religiosity. And I think the the book itself it's uh, a new approach, a more sophisticated approach to to faith and in some way to 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 God and to repentance and to uh, introspection. And, Mm, I agree that's... completely with everything you said. Uh, I hate the I hate the the character, but I recognize that the, you know the, there's a little bit of that in everyone. You can be in that situation. You're going to try to rationalize, you know, in the this most odious action <laughs> sometimes. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I I I completely agree with that. It, I I hate that that that's in all of us. Possibly, the possibility. No, why? That's that's human nature. If we don't if we understand that, we don't understand human nature. That's why communism uh, fails consistently. Because I, I agree. So, the, some, schism, okay. the book is full of schisms. Where I mean, he he went into a burning building and saved people. He gave away money <clears throat> to help a family. I mean, he he's uh, and that doesn't outweigh the balance of actually murdering people but uh it, it shows parts of him that that are on both sides of the of the ledger so to speak i i want to mention that he wasn't uh that he was he was not um, he didn't have emotions i i felt like the complete opposite i felt like he was completely just emotionally driven which is why he would like feel for someone throw a bunch of money at them and then later on go wait a minute that was dumb like what why did i do that um, and, and I think, I, like, I, I actually viewed him as someone who was extremely emotional. In fact, his entire philosophy, I think, was driven by uh, an emotional distaste for other people and, like, a resentment for the world and his position in the world and this, like, kind of nihilistic feeling. Like, that. that's – he he used his mind to try and rationalize behavior that he just felt like doing, I think. I think – Go ahead. I agree that I think I think you're to your point earlier, Carter. I don't think he was I don't think he's meant to be a psychopath. I went back and forth on this, but because sometimes I thought, oh, he clearly is. And other times I'm like, no, I think he's like you said, trying to see if he can be like that. But he does have moments of like the girl that's stumbling in the street drunk who he follows her to make sure the other guy doesn't rape her. And then he gives her like the only money he has, he gives to the cop to give her for a taxi. And, and then later he kicks himself like, why did I do that? You know, because I think he wants to be without feeling and without, he wants to be this superhuman psychopathic person, but I don't think he is. That's why he confesses. I don't think a psychopath would confess would be, pulled into um would be eaten up he's like eaten up he's going mad or by because of what he did even though we don't see him talking about how you know awful it was he we don't see him internally like how could i have done something so awful it, it, he kind of shows us how it's eating him up that's the way i came away from it anyway but i can totally see the other reading too so i think um I think it, I think it's really interesting because of that, it, it making you making us tackle those questions of like, what is this person's damage, <laughs> and can they be saved or not? You know, can they be pulled back and, and redeemed, and do they have a desire to be redeemed? You know, which follows him all the way, as you as you pointed out, even into prison, even after he's confessed, he still hasn't he still hasn't really repented, not until the very end. He's in prison sitting there like, like you said, oh, the only mistake I made was not, you know, executing it the right way. But I don't know. Right. Do so you think, he, do you think he, he actually... did repent at the end? Like, was that real repentance and how do we know? And what, what caused him to repent? What was the thing? I think of, he repented at the end. I, don't know. I think that he actually was going mad, not because he felt repentance at the beginning. He was probably going crazy because he thought he was going to be caught. And that was what was making him sort of worried. He was he was always worried that this this 
policeman guy. Uh, it's the names are a little tricky, right? They, everybody had like these nicknames that were not their name, and then they were be referred to by their name and all that. But the por Porfiry, I think Porfiry it was Petrovich. He, he he that he was doing like some sort of like uh, reverse psychology on him, and uh, he was convinced that they knew that it was him. And so because of that guilty conscience, not the guilty conscience perhaps, but the fact that he was going to get caught, or oh, they knew it was me. They're about to come and get me. That was what was going, driving him crazy. More than actually, I think, a guilty conscience, per se. I think that's what at first started it. And he did feel bad about killing the Lisabetta, right? Not uh, the older lady, the pawnbroker lady. But. I, I think that he did have guilt because the few times that he tries to rationalize his actions after the fact, he kind of avoids thinking of even trying to rationalize the other murder like because that's the one he actually feels guilty for because there is no rationality for murdering her except for the fact that she caught him in the act and that's really hard to rationalize so he avoids even thinking about it and that makes me think he is feeling guilty over that um the whole way through he like tries really hard to just avoid the subject entirely um, until I think it's too much for him. Like he can't handle it anymore. And I don't think he's a psychopath either. I don't um, because of the, the guilt and the emotion. He has so much emotion. It's insane to me. And then also at the same time, uh, like there were points where I was like, he's just paranoid, like about Dunya's fiance. I was like, he's being irrational and, and paranoid about this guy. And then it turned out he was right about that guy. He was a, you know, piece of crap human being. And I actually disliked that guy more than the main character <laughs> because he was so mercenary in how he behaved with other people over the, like the most petty BS. He has no reason to be, to be as mean as he is to Sonia. And so like, to me, I'm, I'm like, he's really trash, like above and beyond. Like he may not be a murderer, but like, this is the kind of guy who hurts people every single day and does not think twice about it. That was the impression I got from that man, as opposed to the main character who often is like, he feels guilty. He even, I mean, he confesses. Does the other guy ever confess to any of the things he was trying to pull on people? No, because he doesn't care. So I, it's kind of funny to me, but I, I, I did dislike that guy more. Yeah, I, I think that's the the schism we were talking about, and I kept, and maybe it's because one of the things that I heard about this book before reading it, um, I, I made that fatal mistake, Alex, is that um, Dostoevsky takes. Nietzsche's philosophy and tests it in literature. And I kept thinking about that. And there's so many instances in this book where it's also a commentary that's going on the culture at the time with these um, socialists and progressives, as they're called, and a scientific way of thinking about society and using that rationalization where we're as a, as a society, we're supposed to advance beyond that unconscious, beyond that um, emotional level and only use you know, pure reason to be able to justify what it is we're doing. And over and over and over again, there's even a long speech and even in part of the article that he writes, he talks about that. And they talk about how crime is, you know, it's, it's the... Um, idea today is that crime is only because of a bad society. It's not the person, et cetera, et cetera. So I keep looking at this also in as a commentary on what actually happens if you actually try to build a society like that, where you try to just create your own values, use that rationality, um, and then figuring out that his unconscious is actually speaking back to him and regardless of how smart and rational he is there's some underlying structure to the nature of humanity that's saying 
you know what, you can come up with all kind of mathematical reasons why you think you can do A, B, and C, but you don't create values. You don't create morality. There's something innate in us that is pushing us in a direction that's going to tell us what all of these things are. And I, I think that's why I don't like to think of him as crazy or insane or a psychopath, because it's it would take away from the fact that it's really just showing us how we have to eat as as rational as we get. We have to remember that consciousness emerges from unconsciousness. So we're still attached to that. And that's a forever thing. And we still have to look back into it since we came from there. Whatever we have now comes from there as well to get new things and develop further. So even as those things pull apart, we have to remember that we're not able to just pop off and float off into abstractions and forms and things like that. We're still, we still need to keep our feet grounded in that. I agree. His article was basically almost spitting out Nietzsche about the Uber mention. And, you know, I, I'm, <clears throat> I can step over it is what he says. And, uh, and then, you know, that's part of him. And then the whole rest of the book, he's trying, he thought that this rationality was the way to go and, and he could do it. And the whole rest of the book is him trying to walk that walk and he can't, he can't walk the walk all the way through. Yeah, exactly. One of the things that's one of the things I enjoy about this as well, because I think it's an indictment of of the nihilism, which is clearly referenced and also utilitarianism. I think Raskolnikov in some way is like uh, the model utilitarian um, mixed with some Nietzsche. Right. <laughs> um, and so he tries to live all these things out. And one of the things that I really like about it is um, I as someone who thinks that there are psychological consequences to uh, bad behavior, to immorality. Um, there's what I really like is that he, even as well thought out as he is, like he has, he's, he's smart. It's well thought out. I mean, they, they clearly show that he's smart. He's got this, I guess, getting an article published at such a young age is a big, big deal. Um, he's thought through this stuff. He's, he's depicted as someone who's really thought through this and is smart, but even he is subject to the reality that his psychology cannot escape the reality of is his, his humanity and actually none of that really matters like he still suffers the consequences he can't think his way out of murder um which i which i think is i think is great i love it i did i do absolutely agree with that utilitarianism in there because there's that conversation he overhears where someone goes on if someone were to murder her then all the like the world would be better off you know, that money could be used to help so many people. Like, that's utilitarianism right there. And and then also, I 100% I agree with you, Carter, that there are there is psychological fallout from doing something horrible. Like, a lot of people want to act like revenge, like, against someone who's horrible is like, oh, that's totally, you know, justified. I'm like, what will that do to you? What will, what? like, I just, I never, ever get that. I'm always like, that is going to do something horrible to you to do those kind of acts, regardless of what you think of that person. It's going to be awful. <laughs> yes. And that's, and that's precisely the argument of the, of the Marxist. You know, if I just kill this person, everything's going to be fine. But I have to, uh, I have a comment on uh, something you said, Mr. I don't really, sorry, I don't know your name. Um, and it's beside the book. But it's a it's a comment on pure rationalism and um, utilitarian thought. That people believe that reason is uh, it's uh, paramount, and that people can be purely re reasonable and uh, follow the science and uh, get the vaccine and so on. And uh, when in reality the the hierarchy it's completely inverted. Because the most important, the way I see it physiologically, is that the most important uh, thing is a sensational, sensational wrong. We have to fulfill our uh, basic uh, needs, and we we go to through the world perceiving things. And then on top of that, you create an emotional world. And then on top of that, you create a, a rational world, world that is subordinated to your emotional world and to sensational world. The sensational world. So the hierarchy is upside down. 
if you don't if you don't understand your emotions, you're never going to be rational because uh, uh, your rationality is created to fulfill your emotional uh, being, and then to to satisfy your your physiological needs. So I think the 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 way people the rationalists uh, see the world is completely uh, off. I mean, obviously, I, actually, I would disagree with that characterization, but oof. I see your point and agree with what you're saying. I, that's not how I would say it, but I, 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 uh, I kind of see what you're saying. Uh, I don't think it's rational to start with a blank sheet of paper when figuring out how to organize society or what morals are. I think it's the rational. Rational begins with induction from reality, and we are human beings who have emotions and have needs and desires and all of the reason is our only means for perceiving reality and, and having correspond like reality correspondence to our concepts and, and making sure that they're correct. And so that in that way, I am a worshiper of reason, but it can't be reason, but reason starts with induction. It starts with reality. It doesn't start with a blank sheet of paper. And I think in, in the Marxist idea, uh, a lot of Marxists start with this like assumption that, uh, we're going to start with a blank sheet of paper. How do we construct a society? And if only people could do these things, it would all work out really well. And it's like, well, that's not how, that's not actually rational. The rational thing is to do is to recognize we are animals with certain needs and desires. And now given that context, how do we make sense of reality and what do we do in that context? And so I, 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 I wouldn't describe it exactly the same way, but I agree with kind of what you're saying, which is this like detachment, this detachment from humanity and kind of this armchair designing of, of philosophy and political systems that are detached from the nature of man, right? Which is, yeah. which is what the problem with communism is. It's just detached from the nature of man. I think we are presenting the same page. No, no, no real disagreement. Yeah. <laughs> I keep saying to people that it's irrational to ignore emotional concerns because they exist. You can't get around the fact that they exist. So that's that's my way of saying it. But I, I think we all kind of agree. We're just wording it differently, essentially. <laughs> that um, but I I I agree that it's not uh it it is faux rationality that they think by ignoring emotionality, which is a common thing. I mean, I think it's incredibly common, um, but it, they don't understand that it's faux rationality. I, I think that's the real problem. Can I ask you a random question? Why did he like Sonia and why did Sonia like him? I, I, that was I the one thing that, that I couldn't track. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I think you can't track it because it's God. <laughs> you know what my answer is she's got sonia is actually devout she has a belief in something uh, bigger than herself and and bigger than any of like justifications or rationality or she has what would be described by some as an irrational belief in God, I think, given her circumstances, I think it's why she's able to continue and persist given her circumstances and given what she's having to do for a living. Um, she has more of a, like, like look at the way her stepmom died and, and rejected the priest and, you know, has, because she's so much bigger than God. She knows God should forgive her. She suffered so much, you know, like how arrogant and, the, and, and Russian, Sonia, and Russian. but Sonia is not like that. Sonia is actually humble. And I mean, my answer is obviously coming from a Christian place. And maybe this is why I think this is a Christian novel, but I think he sees something in her that he can't really explain. And if, and an ease of forgiveness, an easy, an easy forgiveness. And that's why he goes to her before he confesses. And that's why he has to keep seeing her before he confesses. Because he can't, he, he doesn't, even at the end when he thinks he's in love with her, I think he's in love with God inside of her. But but he sees something in her that he's in love with. He can't really even explain. He's like, why do the prisoners like her? Why does everybody, you know? And I think it's it both 
repels him, but then is he wants it though. And that's I, my Christian take on it. I, I think initially it, it was a part of his rationality because even when she, he hadn't even known her and when she came over to his, his closet apartment, he, he introduced her like she was high society or, or on par society to his mom and, and his sister and everybody. He didn't make it out like she was a lady of the night or anything like that or, or not, uh, not on the same level as everybody else. But then over time, I think, as Carrie's stating, he, <clears throat> he starts to feel um, some of that warmth and, and uh, towards her. I, I just curious, wanted I to congratulate congratulate you for okay, saying "Lady ahead. of the Night." That's the first time it's been said in our channel. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> I just, see, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Dostoevsky was Christian, and he was specifically arguing against John Stuart Mill and Nietzsche, and like he was against the utilitarians, against uh, against the nihilists, and this is intentionally a pro-Christian indictment of all of that. I think I don't think Kerry's off was, on that at all. He was Christian, Absolutely. and he, he ended up going to prison for writing something. And I think in prison, he, he mingled with both sets, atheists and Christians, and he saw that one side behaved one way and the Christians behaved another way. And he kind of took the hope side. With, it's kind of my take on his history. Yeah, and... It also reminds me a lot of what happened in the Gulag Archipelago because Solzhenitsyn made a very specific case about the difference between people in prison that were and were not religious. So when I was when I was getting to know Sonia, I kept thinking, Rody is starting to see that he, what his rationalization alone isn't getting him what he wants. He's not able to cross that line. Why can't I cross that line? And then seeing her in a, an equally or but different destitute position that should be full of emotional trauma, but she still has this hope. So he's frustrated and he's going to her because of that frustration he wants to understand. And yeah, maybe at the end, I don't think it was necessarily atonement, but I do think that he's starting to feel and whatever it is that he's getting from Sonia. And I think he's, he's getting an internal realization of what all that is. Uh, her what, what, love for, I'm sorry. Uh, her love for uh, Raskolnikov is almost like a mother's love for a child who just lost his way completely. She's so devoted to bringing him out of it or back if it's you know redemptive um and just uh, she is um in a religious sense and just in 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 uh, just speaking of humanity in general she is she is truly giving and loving despite a, despite all of his shortcomings and what he did she can kind of just see through all of that and bring him back to to being a human being um and i think at the end of the novel it says um that life had stepped into the place of theory and something quite different would work itself out in his mind that there's that possibility uh possibly another book of 500 pages but <laughs> it's getting there i agree with carrie and uh, i think they are raskolnikov and sonia they are kind of uh, complementary characters. They're the opposite. That's why they, they attract in a way. And to that, I would like to add that I one thing that is interesting uh, in in the plot is that he takes the role of uh, Mer Mermelov, what's the name? He takes a Marmalade. father role. Uh, Marmalade. In the family. Marmalade, yeah. Uh, he takes a fa a, the father role. And uh, this, they all depraved. They're, they're love depraved and they're meaning depraved. And the things that give you mean, meaning is a role uh, you you play. And Raskolnikov is going escaping that role from his family. He's not manning up. And with Sonia, when he sees a tragic situation, he starts to man up and try to take responsibility for this family in which he kind of inserts himself uh, in a way. I think that's pivotal to understand his psychological growth throughout the novel. 
You know, Sonia yes. could be just as resentful. Like her life is absolutely horrible. And she doesn't take that route. And mm -hmm. he's just resentful all the way. And I think I agree with Carter when you said he's led by, he is led by emotion, like self, self, selfish emotion. But he doesn't have any um, affection or respect or humility and, and, and um, just recognizing humanity and others empathy like it's just their empathy that's the word i'm looking for well but yeah. doesn't he have some latent empathy that squeaks out once in a while which is why he yeah. behaves and then and then he doesn't like that about himself that's I mean, the point yeah. just, like sagita you you hated him right i i think you didn't like him <laughs> well i i sonia just, loves I him so, why? i just wanted to shake him like you loser like not there you know do something He's like, well, I'm probably I'm not doing anything because I just chatter all the time. Maybe I'm just chatter all the time. That's why I don't do anything. That was the one of the on the first page of the book. Like he's I just wanted to shake him out of it. Like, no, you got to do something. I think it's the opposite but of the world. Christ. does not owe you anything. Well, it's like the opposite of Christ going to the prostitute. Um, it seems like it's been switched here where the prostitute is the one that's actually going to him and she already has the faith. Um, so I think, I, you know, I think you're spot on when when you're saying that she wants to lead him out because um, there's probably something in her that's looking for the lowest person on the totem pole the same way that Christ did looking for the lowest person on the totem pole as a prostitute. But spiritually lowest, not not in not poverty yes. lowest or in the worst circumstances. Right. is clearly the, the most spiritually corrupt person in the book. Exactly. Right? Even though I agree with Alex that I dislike that other guy worse. But I think yes. she can see something in him that's he's able to be redeemed, unlike a psychopath, <laughs> unlike right, the right. other guy that Alex hated more. She unlike you know, him. yeah, she believes that he can be redeemed and uh and and oh, what was I going to say? Oh, that the part where he where he went to her before he confessed, and she literally gave him a cross, and he said something about taking up his cross, and it made me think of Jordan Peterson and how he's referenced this book before, and and also in a lot of his lectures he's talked about you know shouldering your cross and kind of what you're you're saying, Sandra, like taking on your responsibility and taking on a role and and bearing your your sufferings, whatever they may be with grace instead of with woe is me, which I think we're all prone to want to be woe is me at times. And, and the challenge is, is shaking that off and, and being humble. So I, yeah, I, I didn't know he was a Christian, but that doesn't surprise me now. Cause at the end I was like, Oh my gosh, this guy just wrote like the best, most darkest depraved Christian novel I've ever read. I love it. <laughs> There's a there's a um, a podcast called Martyr Made uh, by Daryl Cooper and he uh, he he talks about Dostoevsky and Nietzsche. I mean, he just does a just an amazing study of the two of them and like where their lives. There are so many coincidences and their philosophy. It just at some point they diverge completely, and it's that one thing separating them. It's I, I highly recommend listening to to that one. It's it's amazing. I've I've got a question for you at the end here. Um, right before Sonia shows up and he throws himself at her feet, Dostoevsky includes this, um, basically is I guess like nomads across the river, um, that Raskolnikov sees. And there's a biblical reference here, right? Uh, one of the lines is, freedom was there, there other people lived, so utterly unlike those on this side of the river that it seemed as though with them time had stood still and the age of Abraham and his flocks was still the present. What is the... I've been trying to think about... There's, there's a reason that those people are there. <laughs> I think they're meant to be some kind of trigger in his psychology... But I can't exactly tease out what exactly, how exactly they triggered Raskolnikov. People, people are about to cross uh, the Jordan into Israel. So you think it's just a metaphor? Mm, yeah. 
I think that's Bro, probably is that real. Nomads across the river into Israel, maybe. I thought I thought of it a little differently, um, and it reminded me of a personal experience when uh, we were in Afghanistan, um, seeing the young children with um, the goats and the herds, and they even had slingshots. So when I was a little kid, my grandmother bought me one of the slingshots, just like uh, David had, because we used to go to the little Jewish store, and it's just like a little fabric thing. You you know, I didn't know how to do it as a kid, but they are using that same stuff. And I kept thinking, this whole place looks like the pictures in my little kid Bible from 30 plus years ago. And when I heard him talking about the nomads, it made me think of those people. And I kept thinking that he's looking at that and it's a it's in contrast to what's on his side of the river where they have progress and they have money and they have all these things but he's in love with a prostitute he's guilty of murder everyone's poor people are drunk so what is it that all this progress is leading to and why are those people over there on the other side of the river just staying over there on the other side of the river have no desire to do whatever it is we're doing here kind of like looking at the amish here in pennsylvania you know who's living the better life yes <laughs> i like yes, both of those answers cross the like river sorry yeah i don't know i don't know if the, but the nomads i don't know if they were preparing to cross the river or no, if no, no. the river was just a line and that he was looking at he's the one who has to prefer to prepare to cross the river to go into the holy land not the nomads yeah but I, is he but because when he's going yeah. to the holy land is uh renouncing all his uh mental structure of mm. what is uh proper in society does he have to actually does he actually cross that river when he goes to prison mm, going to prison is crossing crossing the river well, but I, 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 he was talking about the the journey on the way. So I, I'm, you're probably right. I see your point. But I, I'm wondering if he actually did it in the book too, because I remember he talked mm -hmm. about going across, go, going to prison, and all the things that he was going to see and how he's going to see them differently on the way to prison. But his redemption doesn't happen when he goes to prison, right? It happens right after this scene. And just, I don't know if this is helpful or not. Because uh, I don't have the answers, but I'm just going to there's a note in my version that says that that scene is a ref is an allusion to John 833, which if I look up says they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Um, hmm. That just confuses me more, but maybe someone will use so that to come up with something. It's another really. dichotomy where he's in he's not free he's in prison and they're free and even though i mean they live a simple lifestyle on the other side of the river even before he's in prison he's in prison i was about to say that that he's not free beforehand either or he's free when he gets into prison because he renounced his uh structural high on my own supply kind of uh game or maybe he's free when he not when he gets to prison, but when he lets go and well, accepts yeah. that he's in prison, which is when he's throwing himself at Sonia's feet and like that's his freedom. Yeah, that's his when, yeah. when he feet. takes the cross, Carrie. When he takes the cross, he's free. <laughs> I think that's the beginning the of earlier? it. He takes the cross earlier, but I, I think that's the beginning of it. He's making the motions, he's making the confession, but I don't think he's truly repentant until the very end. Even when he like, because he's still having that, and 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 I think for some people that might um, coincide with their, for Christians anyway, that might coincide with their own redemption story, and for people who've grappled with if they are believers or not, I've seen people who, who come to a, decide that they're Christians and come to a, a faith in God, but are more, uh, what's the word, following from a from a. I'm going to, I'm going to, I believe this is the best way to live the Bible. I'm going to, I'm going to do this because I'm at my lowest point. And I don't know what else to do. And 
I'm going to fake it till I make it. And they don't have that transcendent experience until later. I've seen that happen. Our preacher gave a sermon where he, it was such a great sermon. He, he was talking about uh, how he used to, he wasn't a believer. His wife was. And he used to look at her faith and say, I, he was amazed by it and he wished he had it. And he said, it's too bad. Her God doesn't exist. Something like that. I wish, I wish his, her, this God she believes in did exist. I wish I had that, what she has. And he came to belief through, I think he said, even on his baptism day, he was praying, God help me with my disbelief. And God answered his prayers for him. But I know other people have a story like that. I'm sorry, I'm making a Christian tangent, but it, I think, uh, uh, what do you call him? Roni? Rody? Rody. <laughs> Rody. Well, yeah. I think Rody's like that. He's sort of, he's like, it's in stages. He's like, okay, I'm going to take up the cross because I believe in this girl. I don't really have that experience with God or whatever, that transcendent moment or that thing that's changed me yet, but I'm at the lowest I can possibly be. And this girl has something I don't have and she thinks I should confess. So I'm going to confess, but he doesn't really have that transcendent moment until later. That's and the big breakthrough on. comes after he has that crazy dream in prison. Um, with wow. What a dream it boils down to. Yeah. It's a world full of Raskolnikovs thinking that they're above every morality and if it's a world full of them <laughs> you get a pandemic of just you know this horrific dream that can be reality <laughs> you know if too many people get drunk on that idea um and that's when he, he comes out of it sort of a different person at that point yeah a virus from china that's what that's at the, <laughs> at the end. Well, I was reading. Did I read not make the, everyone think of the pandemic? I read that dream and I was like, oh my God. Right. I, I was reading. The first time I read the book was March 2020. That's when it was like, oh wow. First we closed down and I was like, oh wow. <laughs> I know it's just a coincidence, but that was weird. <laughs> Only yeah, 15 I, days, 15 more days. Yeah. Flat in the <laughs> lower the. So I, I remember I think the story that, is common of the 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 works before the spiritual redemption, right? Mm -hmm. And I I see what you're saying about that path where he like he sees something in Sonia and he but he doesn't have any idea what it is and it doesn't matter. It's the only thing that he sees in the world that he wants in any way, um, and so he follows it. In the Marine Corps, they have people they just tell you, "Hey, fake it till you make it," and there's talking about motivation. So a lot of these guys who will fake motivation, like, yeah, I'm all about it. Let's do it. Let's do that. Up, down, up, down. Next thing you know, they're actually truly motivated and they're so motivated, they're annoying. And they, it's just a part of their personality moving forward for the rest of their lives. So it works in real life in many yeah, ways. With, with Christianity, I've just started entering the annoying Christian phase. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question because this is the part of the book that kind of stuck out to me a bit. The suicide of the guy who was like kind of stalkerish of Sonia, uh, uh, Don, not <laughs> Sonia, uh, Donia. Um, I laughed out loud at that scene. And it's not because I found the suicide itself funny, but because of the guy he does it in front of is basically like, no, 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 you can't do that here. Like, go do that somewhere else. Go hide, and get I, out of here. Yeah, I was, he, he like, he's like, no, wait. And I I know it, it sounds awful, but it, it, I don't, and I don't know that it's meant to be funny so much as it's meant to show how little some people care about other human beings, <laughs> that the real problem with him committing suicide is the mess it's gonna create. But then also, I have a lot of questions about that character and like why he committed suicide in the first place. I guess he forecasted He's also that. People. I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead, go ahead. He forecasted it earlier when he was was speaking with Rhodey. I mean, he said you've got two ways: either come clean and and <clears throat> redeem yourself, essentially, or it's the river or the gun. And I mean, so he forecasted that. And I think it just weighed on him because he was such a, a pervert or, or dirty guy or whatever you want to call him. I mean, it finally just was too much. <clears throat> I think he killed he killed his wife as well, but they never proved it. 
Like, it seems like he was responsible for several deaths and they were haunting him. <laughs> and he just, he takes the easy way out, I guess. But it was Donya's rejection of him that ultimately precipitated this, right? Which is, mm. it's just weird. It's not like, oh, I'm guilt ridden because of the lives I've taken, the things I've done. It's like, it's it's that rejection. I almost wonder if she's his Sonia for some reason. And, uh, but yes. his Sonia doesn't love him and accept him. So oh, yes, he has to take the other way. She tried to shoot him. <laughs> and he didn't, I mean, right. he was fine with it being shot rather yeah because i think he latched on in the same way that raskolnikov was found something in sonia he found something in in what's her name the sister and Donia. donetska or Dunia. Dunia. and uh but but she wasn't she didn't reciprocate she didn't see any value in him unlike unlike sonia so maybe that's the only option left open i found his speech about how he convinced women married women to have sex with him like horrible and at the same time kind of hilarious because i was like i don't hardly believe that you're telling me the truth right now that you really got this done every single time except for dunya like i don't i don't actually trust that this is what happened like multiple times uh like i don't know he was so unscrupulous that i just didn't trust anything he said kind of like a voice of conscience maybe trying to awaken in Raskolnikov himself like something tugging at him Svidrigailov was that that kind of maybe here's how despicable you are really <laughs> look at me um see yourself what are you gonna do you know Alex maybe you know I can take your lead and talk about scenes that I thought were funny, you know, since that one made you laugh out loud when someone shot themselves in the face. Um, but the one that I thought was the funniest and almost the most annoying, it was tough to read because there was so much going on. But after the funeral, um, there the, the, the name of that woman, I forget, but the one that ended up going crazy and dying, um, she had a dinner at her house and all these people were showing up and all these arguments ensued. It was just so insane. I couldn't imagine what a dinner party would be like with all of these people. And she kept saying this really weird thing, and maybe it's something lost in translation. But she, you know, and it, it seemed like there was a lot of people who were so destitute that the only thing that they had going for them was that they used to know somebody who was rich. And I'm going to talk about somebody I used to know that was rich, which means that I'm a much better person than you. And she said she, she kept talking about this guy who would go around spending money and he was very important. And he put his hands in his pockets and go poof, poof, poof. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? I mean, is it translated differently for me or do you guys remember that? I do. That was the landlady that did it at yeah. Katarina's dinner. And um, she, and I, I never understood that was like, what the hell is she? I don't know what she's doing, but I will say maybe Carrie will appreciate this. That entire scene reminded me of bringing a baby because there's scenes in bringing up baby where it's just utter chaos. And that's what makes it funny. Yeah. And it was just like that whole scene was so chaotic and nonsensical that I, I kept, also found I kept it pretty reading funny. it in my head yeah. in the voice of Borat for some reason. Every time I heard it go, boof, 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 he's gonna walk around the town like this. I love like, how the, the, the German poof, poof woman... Does anyone know? I don't know. And she was I proud the of it. The German woman and, and, the, and the woman holding the dinner were kept trying to like insult each other without actually insulting each other and everyone at the, the narrator is all like everyone knows that you know trouble is coming like it was it was a very comedic scene it, it was because yeah like it was uncomfortable it was like viscerally uncomfortable how much these two women hated each other and the jabs they took at each other but at the same time they were so shallow and stupid that it was hilarious yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned German because I noticed there's all these German people that they keep talking about and there's and they have their stereotypes about what the Germans are, what they're like. And it reminded me of black rednecks and white liberals. 
how he was always taught, well, not always, but there's a whole section on Germans and how they were influencing or part of um, different cultures throughout the world, whether it was in Russia or Argentina, and they all tended to do the exact same thing. And here it is in Crime and Punishment. There's He's talking about all the Russians, not all of them, but several Germans in Russia and um, their place in society. And Raskolnikov wears a German hat. Yeah, which tells you a lot. You know, yeah. he's thinking through other people's ideas. Uh, yeah, that's a great the, point. The society of peasants, you know, yes. wants to be like uh, Sherman. No insult to, to Russian. I think the Russians are great. Uh, but you know, in the context, they are looking up to Germany, and they have like an identity crisis. Identity crisis. And I, Raskolnikov is in an identity crisis all throughout the book because. He does. It. There's a something uh, I think a Cuban writer wrote about him, like a French, uh, a Frenchman doesn't, or an Englishman doesn't wonder about what does it mean to be French or British. <laughs> the years hard. But Russia at the same time is a crisis of meaning in that. Yeah. And the book is prophetic to what's about to happen the next century, because those are the same questions. Yeah, I just I happened to run across. I was looking for something else, but uh, this relates to something we were talking about before. There's a line I underlined. Um, again, this is so. This stuff is like Dostoevsky's pretty, like, pretty intentionally anti-Marxist. So he's there's some references to Belinsky and Dobro Lunbov. I can't pronounce it, uh, but I, I guess uh, I think Belinsky was like. Uh, a Russian literary critic, and the other guy was one of Marx's favorite poets, right? But there's this line where it says, the environment is everything and the man is nothing. And like, I think that's one of these fundamental flaws that, that does guest is trying to point out, like, this is really what they believe, that there is no, like the man is nothing and the environment is everything. And that's the entire philosophy um, kind of distilled into this entire Marxist philosophy. Um, I wonder how then incredibly brave, smart, courageous, successful people ever come out of societies that aren't perfect. If if it's all the environment and not the man. Bite your tongue. I'll mute myself. <laughs> yeah, cancel yourself, Thomas, because that's a wrong thing. Um, I think it's funny that he was that Raskolnikov was. So actually, there, there's something actually I, I think um, correct about his view. Don't take me the wrong way, but there's some, there's something correct about Raskolnikov's view that I appreciate um, that isn't really gotten into here too much. But he recognizes a truth, which is that sometimes really horrible people are admired and do get away with it and are considered great. And this entire this like this the, the uh, his his um association with napoleon his obsession with napoleon is in this example of like well he would like these people would do these things and there's a truth there there are historically people who do horrible horrible things and yet history history rewards them um they get away with it and they're considered they're considered great which i think is a problem with history not a, not 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 an endorsement of what they've done but i am starting to think I used to think that was the minority of people in position of power. I am starting to rethink it might be the majority of people in positions of power are psychopaths. <laughs> um, Do you think based Dostoevsky on... believed that? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that. What do other people think? I, I think okay. we use that word psychopath too much <laughs> instead of Instead of just letting letting power corrupt the normal individual human being. I do think, um, because they've done some research into this, that a lot of CEOs, there's, there's an outsized number of C CEOs who are actually uh, sociopathic. Like, that is a thing. Um, so there's a, I think there's a personality that's drawn to power um, that is, that, sees it as an opportunity and that's dangerous um, because it's a, it's not a very um, compassionate personality. 
Um, but I do think there are people, uh, and this comes down to a, a, a Thomas Sowell kind of idea, there are people who like to get into positions in pow of power to make sure that um, things don't get worse. Like, I do think there are those people that are like, we need to limit things. We don't, and those people, I think, are less common, actually. Um, uh, and that's like a, a, the idea of the constrained vision. They don't think that positions of power should be used to socially construct um, humanity. Um, but I don't think that that those people commonly go into politics or power because I, I just think that someone who wants to socially construct society will go after positions that let them do that, yes. unfortunately. Um, I don't think it's um, necessarily that the position is the problem so much as it's the the idea that this is an opportunity to these people. Uh, it's sort of like the whole idea that predators find places to uh, get access to the people they want to victimize. Yeah. It's that same kind of concept. I would only disagree, maybe, and I'm not sure if you if we are talking about different things, but um, I think the position is the problem often. Um, and the fact that we even create these positions of power gives us an opportunity to put either a good or a bad person there where we shouldn't even have those positions of power in the first place. But hierarchy is good, always good to be there. Yeah. Did you go, always going to have a hierarchy? Well, but there's yes. a difference between hierarchy and what Thomas is saying, right? Where like this, this is what you're saying, Thomas, is like the classical argument about uh, bloated governments, right? You give a bunch of bureaucrats and people a lot of power, and of course people are going to fight over it, bribe people for it, seize the gun, do stuff. Like if they don't have power, if those positions don't exist, none of that happens, right? Um, yeah, but the, their initial intent was not that people would get there and stay there for a lifetime. They would come. sure do their stuff and then go back to the farm or whatever enterprise they right. had. I mean, that was the original intent. And now we've got unelected people <clears throat> who are there for a lifetime with power. Yeah. I don't have an answer. I'm just like, clearly that wasn't the intent, but it did happen and we are here. And, uh, and, and I think it is true that like there are people who, for example, might not be successful in a free market, uh, very successful. They might be much less successful, but in a backstabbing game of like uh, house of cards style politics, they do really well and they're drawn to it. And, you know, they, they get a lot more power. It's not that they don't exist, but they're certainly much more impactful when they're a Congresswoman from New York than they are as a bartender, for example. <laughs> I was a bartender. <laughs> Just that. Me too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm from New York. I mean, I'm from Cuba. But not but totally with you. I'd rather have you in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one line. I hope you guys don't mind um, if I read through it. it. It made me really think of something that was really important. And I think it, it gets to not only Dostoevsky's brilliance and being able to understand human psychology um but also at gets to the root of what is going on in the book and it was right after he um buried those pieces of evidence the money and everything underneath the stone and he's walking away um and he starts to have these different emotions and it says yes he remembered later that he laughed a long faint, nervous, inaudible laugh, and that he continued to laugh during the whole time he was crossing the square. And when I thought of that, it made me think of Joker a little bit. After he, he gets to a certain point where he's starting to feel himself um, and something's breaking through. But um, there's something that's uh, kind of a union idea that Eric Neumann wrote about um, that I thought summed it up and helped to um, translate what that means. In neurotic and particularly in hysterical reactions, the failure of the ego and its suffering are frequently accompanied by a smile of pleasure. 
the triumphant grin of the unconscious at having taken possession of the ego. And that made me think of this whole connection um, that we're talking about here, where he's got this huge, strong ego and he's rationalizing, but that smile is that signal of that unconscious coming up and making itself aware and having that conflict. I think I, I love that you brought this line up because I think it, uh, it, it made me think of actually demonic possession. I was thinking yeah. about, you know, you've given yourself over to this act of evil and now you've invited this, maybe you're what you're referring your to door. as the unconscious is now taken over, um, overcome the ego. Yeah. You, you've let the, you, it was at your door and you let it in. And it made me think of people who have committed evil that we've seen in popular news, like being a true crime junkie. Um, you know, the thing that they call duper's delight sometimes, but you can see in interviews with like Chris Watts after he killed his family, his wife and two daughters, his pregnant wife and two daughters. And he's doing interviews with the, like the day after or the day of, and he's talking about how he wants her back. And, and, but he, he's pretending that she was kidnapped and he's talking about how he wants her back and he, but he's like smiling inappropriately at one part. It's just so weird. Um, and I think that it, it was just making me think of people that have those kind of uh, inappropriate emotional responses to evil they've committed. Yeah. And it doesn't always mean I, I watch a, a behavior panel show. That's really great. And of course those things don't always mean everybody has different reactions to shock and stress, but sometimes those things can be tells that there's something else deeper and darker going on, that there's this part of you that you're, you're calling the unconscious. that's like laughing at having gotten away with this thing and like possessing you now, it's sort of grotesque. Anyway, I'm rambling yeah. now. <laughs> well, you talk yeah. about demonic possession. It's something that is very Faustian, uh, Faust, like uh, the book that I think is central and it's important to 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 mention and it's very symbolic and um, some of you may agree with me or not but um, the scene when he uh, before he kills the the old lady he pawns his watch and uh, the watch is a symbol because what's a what's a watch watch is something a device that organizes uh, that is that uh, around which you organize your life. Uh, it's a ruler. It's like a compass. Uh, it's what gives you structure. That's a watch. And it's Kronos. It's Saturn. And Carter, I'm going to talk a little bit about astrology. So you can roll your, your eyes whenever you want. So no, no, um, go ahead. It's this, yeah, it's good. But it's an archetype. So when he's pawning his watch, which is a, a family thing, he's in a way selling, not selling, but pawning his soul to the old lady. Uh, he's giving away his Saturn, his sense of responsibility. And who does he meet during that time? Mermelov. And Mermelov, Mermelade, whatever his name is, uh, it's the portrait of what happens to you when you abdicate your watch, when you abdicate your sense of responsibility, which is what he does with the with the pawn lady. And uh, then he commits it, the murder. But the, the curious thing about the murder is that he kills, he doesn't only kill the old lady, he also kills uh, her sister, who is a nice character. But that doesn't happen by, by chance because it's no real life, it's a book. And in the book, there's a god, and that god is uh, Dostoevsky, who planned that to happen. And uh, what I think what he's trying to say, and I think it's something everybody should do, what he's trying to say is that uh, you can kill one without the other because the old lady and the and the good sister, they are like mirror. They're, they're counterparts. The old lady is it's hoard, hoards money. Uh, it's miserable. She just take 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 take. And in astrology, is something called uh, Rahu and Kedu, the notes of the moon. And uh, one represents the old lady. It's like uh, on dying hunger that just hoards things in. And then Ketu on the other side is the south node of, of the moon, just gives away and detaches you. And it's all loving. It's all loving. Too. In the, the book, uh, the, the sister is described as, as being pregnant every minute. It's not in the translation, but she's pregnant every minute because she, she's, she's, she doesn't have, uh, she's all loving, but she doesn't have structure. 
And what he has to do in the book is to balance these two things. And uh, I think understanding the scene with the watch and the concept that you cannot kill one without the other is, is pivotal to understand the whole narrative of the book. Bravo. And crime doesn't, yeah, it's not an isolated thing. Like it doesn't just affect the person, that one person he was intending to kill. Everyone is affected. There, you know, reverberates mm -hmm. all around him. There are people implicated. There are, um, you know, her poor stepsister who's just, you know, makes the mistake of being there. It's just, it affects everyone. Do you, do you think, given what you're saying, where uh, you know he gives away his watch, and you compared him to, I can't now call him Marmalade because that's what Thomas called him, but whatever, whatever the guy's name is. Uh, Come on, do you think easy. his his uh, <laughs> when he sees him trampled by horses, is he seeing himself? Is he trying to redeem? Like, is he trying to fix his own life in some way? Is that why he fixates on him? Because you were saying earlier that uh, when he met that guy, that's an example of have someone who's given up their soul and given up their, uh, um, I don't know if you use the word control or whatever, but and he he then has just done that, and maybe he's seeing he's seeing consequences. Maybe it's a future version of himself. He's like, oh, that's the end result. I need to save and fix things here because yes. I don't want that end result for myself. And also, as a result, he takes. Uh, the role of, of father of that Mermela Mermela had abdicated, uh, yes, w which give meaning to his life or starts yeah. the process of uh, growing into meaning. Also, that character fell into that trap that Carrie brought up of just like woe is me, and I do find this happens a lot with people who do bad things. They get in if they do feel guilt, it turns into a new kind of uh, indulgence, and that's what it's that character feels like when he's doing his speech about how horrible he is and how much pain he's caused. He's being self indulgent. He's indulging in the idea that he's such a horrible human being that there is no reason why he should ever change, uh, and so he can keep doing what he wants to do, which is drink himself into a stupor every day and spend all his family's money so and and not take responsibility for his life and that's something that a lot of people who do horrible things do they don't it's a it's another way of actually abdicating uh responsibility of because you're not actually if you're taking responsibility but not actually doing anything to change the situation you're not really taking responsibility you're just verbally acknowledging um, how horrible you are, so you continue, can continue to be horrible. Yes. Which is very nihilistic and actually fatalistic in the same way that the the Marxist ideology is with respect to humans. Like, because you've now, it's become, in modern parlance, being a loser becomes your identity. So you're no longer responsible for changing that. It's just who you are. I'm the person that drinks my family's money away. That's who I am. Woe is me. And it's flagellation, but you're doing it in front of people. You're doing it for an audience for that attention yeah. as well. There, I wanted to compare Rhodey for a second with, do you guys remember Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat? The story, The Black I Cat. Don't. Okay, you, so I don't remember. It's really a short story. Black. You can go read it online, um, and, and I would suggest you read it. It's really interesting. He, I think the character in The Black Cat is actually a psychopath. He he doesn't have it, – it's a character who um, first uh, – I think he kills the cat. He it, There's a cat that they, he and his wife take in, and he at first thinks he likes the cat, but then he, but he ends up killing it. Um, but the cat comes back, or another cat comes, but he thinks it's the same cat. And this causes a fight with his wife at some point. And anyway, he kills his wife. And then he's looking for the cat and he can't find the cat, but he, he buries his wife in the house. But I, you should really read this. I'm sorry, I'm spoiling it. But he doesn't have any guilt. He has that glee that you're talking about where he's like laughing, Thomas, after he hides the stuff. He has that glee 
of getting away with something. Um, he shares that with, with Rhodey. But beyond that, he explicitly says, I had to pull it up just so I could remember. He explicitly says he has, he has no guilt about killing her at all. He's euphoric. And it's very different, I think, from, from Rhodey's character. I think they're both, they show... And, and by the way, when I say, I, I think you're right, we use that word psychopath maybe too often, but I think all these personality disorders that we talk about quite a bit, all of it's on a spectrum anyway. So where is Rhodey on this? Is he closer to the psychopath that he wants to be than, than Dunya is? Yes, he is. <laughs> I just don't think he's fully there. I think he's like got these last bits of humanity that pull him back from the brink, that he has something that causes him to want to confess um, and, and to own up to it and to, and to be redeemed. And he, as much as he wants to get rid of that humanity, he can't. Whereas the character in Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat, there's nothing tying him to, there's no humanity. He's just a completely no emotion, no empathy, nothing except extreme glee at having hurt and, and killed others and gotten away with it. Anyway. Uh, the, Hope um, is really interesting. I'm back. Sorry. Oh, hey, man. <laughs> but, You're back. Uh, hey. Uh, yeah, finally, right? And fortunately, power back too. So that's why I'm back home. But um, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting how, like, all all the points you're making about how you know it's sort of like what we talk about today: rules for thee, but not for me. So I can do whatever I I, I can do whatever, and it's okay but other people can't do the same thing. It's sort of hypocritical in a certain, it is hypocritical. But at the same time, Raskolnikov is always like struggling. Although he believes that what he did was okay. He then interacts with other people that he can see that are, you know, even with all their troubles that are fundamentally good. And I think that's what starts drawing him maybe back to you know, the, the, he realizes that what he did was so bad that now he's like struggling with it. And, and, uh, he sees the love, for example, that Sonia has for him. And I mean, all those characters, there was a lot of, I mean, that, uh, he's like, why does she love me? I mean, if, because he knows how he is and he doesn't understand why, why is she loving him? Like he, she does. And, that inner struggle he has is what's probably leading him eventually to uh, to the point where he, you know, he, he wants to confess. But, um, you know, and then like you were saying before, this is like a power uh, in the, the world today. I mean, we see the same, well, not the same thing, but the rules for thee, not for me, where you have people in power who are always, hey, this is what you have to do. But this doesn't, they don't say it, but it doesn't apply to me. I can do whatever, right? And we see it every day. It's how do you get rid of that? I don't know, right? How do you get people that are, you know, that, that, that actually act in the same way as they think people that they want other people to act towards them, right? Like the golden rule do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. And that rule is, is, I mean, that's, fundamental rule that we should all live by i think but um anyways, uh, that is some, going on a tangent here no that's uh, that's actually something that is central in christianism and that's i think probably one of the points that Dr. he was trying to to make you know do you guys think that um i got this sense that when he <clears throat> found sonia that I mean, there was certainly a, a sense that he was trying to torture her sometimes by <laughs> revealing things. But um, I also wonder if the – because he, he – fundamentally, like I know he's rationalizing and saying maybe I'm this ubermensch. But I think fundamentally he's – like there's a lot of self-hatred with Raskolnikov, right? Um, and so I think fundamentally the idea that he doesn't get rejected from Sonia and actually gets affection from Sonia mm – -hmm. I think he needs to test the depths of that. I think one of the reasons that he needs to go confess to her is he's like, well, she seems to like me, but I'm sure if she really knew who I was, she wouldn't. So he just really tries to like push everything onto her. And, and I, I'm not sure he expects to be accepted. I think part of him expects like, 
she'll reject she'll reject me if I reveal enough, but she doesn't. And I think that's one of the things that um, I think that's one of the turning points in his psychology, because I think maybe that's where he finds what Carrie's talking about, which is like, what is it in this person that's not? Re- I just told them. I just told them like this. I'm so evil. And this person didn't reject me. What the hell is that? Um, and and that's what he's addicted to, I think. Yeah, that's the contrast he sees in what he is like. Because when he sees other people doing something that he doesn't think is right, he hates them. But then he, I think what he's doing is he's acting really terribly towards her, just telling her all these bad things he's done because he doesn't want her. I mean, he, he like you said, he's testing and he's he believes that that will turn her away. That's why when she comes to visit at the at the at the prison, he he actually treats her like he doesn't care, right? But he sees how much for whatever reason she still loves him, and I think that's at the end. That's what actually brings him to to realize, you know, the redemption of you know that you know you you. you well, he's too self. He is very self-focused, but maybe he starts seeing that he can, uh, he can lead a different path, and uh, there is redemption for him, and he can take a different way. But it is very interesting. I mean, there's you can analyze this book so many ways. You know, it's it's really a you know it was such a great book, I think. Is, is there another layer? Oh, I was listening to a, um, a lecture by one of the translators of the book into English. I think his name is Michael Katz. And he was talking about how the original title of the book was The Drunkards. I mean, there's a lot of drinking going on in the book. Um, and Raskolnikov, like the little money that he has, he ends up in the tavern drinking. Um Razumihin, who's kind of the voice of reason uh, in many ways, or tries to be, and a devoted friend, maybe. I mean, he ends up drunk and saying all kinds of crazy stuff. And Marmalada, they're they're all there's so much drinking going on. Um, the being drunk figuratively on an idea, and then trying to this experiment, you know, with murder. That's another way of being drunk. Um, but there's this literal drinking going on too. It made me think of, I grew up in Lithuania um, and alcoholism was a humongous problem, huge. And maybe it's changed in Russia, but it was just, I, you know, out of probably eight out of 10 families had parents coming home after work completely drunk. I'm not kidding. This was like they're, you know, you could see them walking home and swaying and, you know, like some of them would touch the ground and get up and go every single day. And it's changed. But that was the reality, like this, this drunkenness and stupor and it just inability to be in reality um, and take responsibility. And it's just how it's overtaken it's like a malaise, a, a, a disease that's taken over people's minds. And that's another thing that maybe the characters are fighting um, or, you know, Raskolnikov and uh, several other characters who end up in, in, in a similar situation who are villains. There is that other disease that they're they're under. Joe, can yeah. you tell us what you said in the private chat? Yeah, I saw a YouTube video on this. He was Dostoevsky was writing two novels at the same time, and his his original intent was <clears throat> the story was supposed to be a short story about alcoholism, and he was writing this one at night, I think. Um, and then it just kind of grew and morphed into into this deep psychological thriller. And I don't know what I don't know what a short story is in Russian literature. Maybe only three hundred pages, not five hundred, but. Um, yeah, that was his original intent. Yeah, I thought I thought it was interesting <laughs> that that dimension of it. Well, I was just looking it up, and one out of every two working age men would die prematurely from alcohol and abuse in Russia. Um, that's gotten better, where it's uh, been reduced as of two thousand four. Um, but before two thousand four, 
it was 75% of all Russian men were heavy drinkers. So even if he isn't writing something specifically about alcoholism, I would imagine that um, it's probably accurate to show that that's a, a common thing that's going on throughout throughout Russian culture. And speaking of Russian culture, I, I, I would, you know, looking at how long the book is and how long the discussions are sometimes, I then was reading, you know, as I'm reading about these people in their lives, I then thought, if you are a person who reads and you live in these times, reading a 600 plus books, mine was six something, um, probably wouldn't be as big of a deal compared to us who are getting up or going to work, we got to check our Twitter, got to, you know, there's Netflix, there's all this other stuff. But I kept imagining them in this culture being like, okay, well, I'm going to read a couple hundred pages a day, because if I'm not gainfully employed, um, and I've all, only got one shirt to wash, you know, what else am I going to be doing? Yeah, and I think that yeah. the period, the 1860s, 1870s in Russia, it was very, uh, term, very much turmoil <clears throat> with all the, the farming revisions they'd done. I, I don't, I'm not 100% on that, but <clears throat> coming into wars, going out of wars. So I, I think <coughs> there was a there was a stark contrast between the society, high and low. Well, wasn't there idea that they're there was an increasing stratification of the classes, uh, some of it on purpose, um, and some of that then later used for the revolution. Um, so, of course, things are hard. This is closer to the revolution. Um, I mean, people don't revolt like that unless things are incredibly difficult already, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good point. It wasn't hard to, it wasn't easy to live in St. Petersburg at that time. Uh, it was hard. And it's, he's, even though he doesn't want to be a teacher and so on, he has opportunities. Um, to some degree, his uh, obsession or his uh, concern with making money, it's, it's, it's understandable. What would you do if you were in that situation with nothing to do? And, uh, no Netflix, so maybe we would end up killing somebody too. And um, and also, and com communism is a horrible comorbidity for alcoholism. You have no idea. But remember, he's writing at a time prior. This is obviously this is like what no, no, 50 I mean, years, sixty no, years before yeah, no, the it's revolution. Before communism. No, I'm talking about yeah. alcoholism, alcoholism. How communism can make alcoholism much worse? Yeah, I guess my point is just he's writing before communism is installed, but he's writing at a time when it is in uh, academic circles. In vogue. Popular, yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is – it's almost like if he were writing today or, or let's imagine him writing in – it's like as if it's like as if he wrote in 1950 about wokeism and was like, hey – this philosophy, here's all these bad things about this philosophy that's going to, like, it's kind of, it eventually comes to to power, but it's well, only really in academic circles that it's being it's, talked about at this time, It's an right? 1800s book about wokeism. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Because wokeism is nothing but being high on your own supply and feeling mm -hmm. su morally superior to other people without doing an introspection. Yeah. Uh, for anybody who's just wa watching and hasn't read the book, I always wonder if people watch these if they haven't read the book. I don't, I'm kind of like, can you follow along if you haven't? Um, but I did want to read just a thing from the letter, that, not the letter, the dream that we talked about at the end, because it's kind of, it, it gave me chills. Uh, if you'll give me a moment, he says he dreamt that the whole world was condemned to a terrible new strange plague that had come to Europe from the depths of Asia. All were to be destroyed except for a very few chosen. Some new sorts of microbes were attacking the bodies of men, but these microbes were endowed with intelligence and will. Men attacked by them became at once mad and furious. 
but never had men considered themselves so intellectual and so completely in possession of the truth as these sufferers. Never had they considered their decisions, their scientific conclusions, their moral convictions so infallible. Whole villages, whole towns, and peoples went mad from the infection. All were excited and did not understand one another. Each thought that he alone had the truth and was wretched looking at the others, beat himself on the breast, wept, and wrung his hands. They did not know how to judge and could not agree what to consider evil and what good. They did not know whom to blame, whom to justify. Men killed each other in a sort of senseless spite. They gathered together in armies against one another, but even on the march, the armies would begin attacking each other. <laughs> the ranks would be broken and the soldiers would fall on each other, stabbing and cutting, biting and devouring each other. Anyway, I just it just made me think of the t current times. <laughs> Doesn't oh, it? It's, so beautiful. it's beautiful. It's it's like yeah. It, if someone it, it, like what you just said, I think it was Sandra that said it. Like it's prophetic. He wrote about wokeism in 1866. Like yes. Yes. it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> The part about they don't know what to, they can't even agree on what's evil and what's good. I mean, right. where there are people, I had some random post on Instagram go viral. I don't even know how that works on Instagram. I don't really understand Instagram, but there are like thousands of people on this post and it's a meme uh, criticizing. Uh, it, it's basically talking about some of the stuff that's been in public school libraries, moms finding out about pornography and stuff. And so there's a bunch of people in there, thousands and they're, people in there who are defending giving pornography to kids. And I'm like, where, when did we take this turn where we can't even agree on like, hey, that's evil. Like, it's just like, no, I'm not gonna debate that with you. Um, I, anyway, it made me think of, it made me think of the, these times and you're right, yeah, he's, he's prophetic. Maybe yeah, we just they're... go through this over and over and over again. Well, the, the, yeah, it's the, just, it's the same doing... ideology. <laughs> it's the same exact ideology. It's just resurrected again and again and again. Exactly. History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Yeah, I like that. It's it, you know, it's, I, I think it is really, there is like a psychological basis to this. There's like, there's a there's a kind of a psychological dysfunction that leads people to adopt these ideologies and then the ideology plays out it doesn't work but it just gets revamped so that the next generation can justify their same psychological like it's the same it's the same psychology this is 1866 it's the same psychology as wokeism it's not exactly the same philosophy but it's just it's the same philosophy that's been tweaked a few times because they couldn't defend it like, okay, the critical theorists are like, I guess we can't defend Marxism exactly. Let's tweak it again. And it's like, they just, it gets tweaked, but it's, it serves the same purpose, which is rationalization of horrible, horrible behavior and now, psychological Only I know how to do it right. Only I know how to do it right this time. <laughs> it, it reminds me of some of the, the cycles. And a lot of this is in biblical co um, cosmology as well to where you have space and time and space is kind of like that island in the middle of the ocean. Um, and time is, you know, fluid and changing and kind of always creeping in on that, on that island. And even as we keep creating this island of reason and truth, um, there's waves kind of keep coming up. And we, I think it's tempting because we know that that island came from the ocean. So we still have to stay connected to the ocean. We still have to look back on it. And we get kind of frustrated with the borders that we create um, on this little island of reason and logic and truth. So we keep dipping our toes out there. And sometimes we find some really cool stuff. You know, oh, wow, that's a new fish and that's super tasty. You know, whatever it may be, you know, out there on the, on the fringes. Um, but sometimes I think what happens is people are so comfortable in our space that they are allowed to spend more time on the fringes and next thing you know the fringes is the space and everything gets turned upside down which is like the flood or the deluge and um, then we have to work on creating that space again so i think that's the psychology of it to where people get tired of the borders um, and they're always pushing at the borders and the more comfortable they are in our space because that space makes them comfortable the less they appreciate it and the more they start pushing out at those borders. 
I think a lot of the um, rhyming throughout history actually um, comes down to those two um, visions that uh, Thomas Sowell brings up in a conflict of visions. Definitely. I think that I, I think a lot of like the because a, a lot of the repeats are someone with an unconstrained vision trying to shape the world to be a better place in their image, um, which I consider deification of the self and a little and absolutely dangerous and arrogant. But um, so that's how I see it keeps repeating itself. It comes down to that basic idea of, I think I know how to make the world a better place. And I think I should have the power to do so regardless of things like civil liberties or freedom of choice. And those kinds no of experience. <laughs> yeah. No experience. Like it's it's a level of arrogance I can't quite imagine. Like myself, I'm I'm like I don't know how you can think that way. But I know there are people. There are a lot of people out there, and they seem to exist in every generation. And it's just how much power do we give them? Well, I something I like to add here. Um, all this wokeism and all that's going on today, and even the Marxist revolution, all these things are not things that happen just bottom up. They happen top down, there's people with interest that finance these things to happen. Like it happened in Russia. It was financed by the Germans and it was financed by Wall Street too. So it's not that this just happened. Actually, th these people were a French minority. And here they're a French minority. Their interests that bring this uh, insanity kind of thing, or this drunkest, drunkenness up. And I think one of the problems and this not this by no makes a, a criticism on on safe space i love the show and i think it's great and i think it's ever purpose but one of the problems with intellectual people is that they, they think that this is a problem this is a debate philosophical debate it's not a philosophical debate it's a propaganda war this is not about who's right no if you cannot really get into a debate with uh, any walkie um you can that's why they don't debate because they can win. It's a propaganda war and it's a meme war. It's a war of haikus, you know, simplifying everything and repeating the most important things over and over and over again, which I know you you do here in the in the show. But it's not an intellectual debate, it's a propaganda war. And it I, I agree with you by the down way. Is bottom, because I come from communism, I lived through it and I, I I always say the same joke and my friends are going to uh be bored with it, but uh I always say not only I watched this movie before, I was an extra. So, but this, the United States looks a lot, it's not like Cuba because in Cuba, boom, they came with weapons and they took over everything, Castro took over everything. And, uh, but in Venezuela, you really have to look, and actually I, I would love if you bring somebody, somebody from Latin America to talk about what happened in Venezuela because it's slow. You have to close it slowly, 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 slowly until you have complete control. And that's how you end uh, working for $10 a month in the name of the proletarian. It's the slow yeah. boiling well, frog so. method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and which is what we've been in for a very long time. And I think some people are noticing the boil and jumping out of the pot, but not enough people at this time, I don't think. Well, or I think it couldn't happen here. Which is the problem? Like, oh no, yes. that can't happen yes. here. Like, yes, it can't I happen hate anywhere. that rationalization so much. It drives me crazy. That will never happen here. That will never. <laughs> Wait, that's what they thought in Venezuela. Yeah, Venezuela. We have a joke. And Venezuela said, that would never happen in Venezuela, pues." It was voted. <laughs> Cuba. It was voted. Well, that's the same <laughs> rationalization people give themselves about not protecting themselves from in individual attack that, oh, that happens to other people. That doesn't happen to me. And it's like, do you think the person who was mugged last night didn't think that this was something that happened to other people? Like, this was the first time they got mugged, obviously. So I, I like, that kind of sense of false security that a lot of human beings have about both their society and their own personal safety, like, it drives me insane. Germany was a paradigm of... Uh, knowledge and uh, virtue and so many things. Uh, there were really a lot of smart people in Germany, and it happened. And it was a French minority. Yeah, yeah and a lot yeah. of those smart people were the ones creating the philosophy that justified making it happen. 
like Nobel yeah. Prize winners. Yeah. Well, Heider, yeah. well, Heider, uh, there was well, there's like th I don't remember the names offhand, but I know there were at least two or three Nobel Prize winners that were writing some of the philosophy utilized for Nazism. But however, I think uh, it's I think that the Americans, the people here in the United States, have, have given up good fight, and it, because it's so this country is so well, it's easy to trash and to see what's bad. But this country is so well thought out. Uh, that's what people don't realize that it's been a lot harder. Like go to Austria, go to Australia. No, they're just doing whatever they want. But in the United States, there's a rule book that people have to at least pretend to follow the Constitution. I think mm. the the founding fathers were visionaries, and uh, thanks to them, uh, we're still standing. I think everything is changing now because since Bill Bill Maher started to test, he's a good cop kind of guy. And, and he's now criticizing. I think everything is going to crumble. Probably, I don't know. But I think the mandate and the whole thing, Hopefully. this whole bullshit, is going to change. No one would. Uh, Not if Neil Young has his say. He's going to get <laughs> Bill Maher canceled. And, and Joni yeah, Mitchell's he, on the train now. I saw that. <laughs> I think he should go really? to so, Joe Rogan and have a, a, have a debate. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. He the should. more you see that's happened the last couple of years, or the last years the more you value what the founding fathers in the u.s did with the constitution you i mean mm -hmm. you start realizing wow i mean mm -hmm. that was incredible because that's what actually sets up everything however you know we're seeing it crumble and uh, you know and well the discussions we have in the groups like us that we talk about liberty and freedom and things like that i think the more people become aware of 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 that, hopefully it will prevent something much, well, much worse needs, happening. Yeah. And but all some people just don't, don't see it. Rejected. They're like, oh, oh they're you know what happens is people are so caught up in there's so much stuff going on in everybody's life that you sometimes like, oh, I'm not paying attention to what's happening. Right? They're yeah, like, well, oh yeah, I, I'm mm -hmm. just I'm I'm it's so stressful to watch the news, so I'm not gonna even watch. I don't know. And uh, that's pro unfortunately it happens. And know, that's how you end up making ten-hour lines to get food. They're disconnected. It's the same thing with individuals, and as it is with ideologies. I just this is the underlining thing that I keep coming back to. This lesson that I've learned this past year is on the small scale, on the large scale, to understand more about human nature. I mean, people I've learned people online will will allow will will not distance themselves from an obvious psychopath like an individual because they're like oh well i really haven't i'm too busy to see all of that and i just you know or i'm afraid or whatever and the and people just won't and an individual i used to think like i was saying earlier that it was very few people in politics who who were lacking empathy and who had uh, a desire for for simply just power and the ability to manipulate but now i'm thinking it's maybe the majority and in every one of those cases there's probably people the whole trajectory that knew what they were and didn't say anything or they were just too busy to notice you know as that kamala harris is rising and it's like everyone looks away at this right. yeah. yeah a lot of people think well, that Fidel castro and che Guevara are cool yeah <laughs> People wear like that shirt with his face on it. Like, yeah. wow, he's like a rebel. Oh, it's amazing. Do you really know the history of that guy? Well, well there's an the anecdote. Way... There's an anecdote that I think is worth uh, mentioning. Uh, it, there's an anecdote where they, they cut a 15 year old kid doing graffiti against Castro when they just took power. And uh, they, they made a summary trial and they sentenced him to, to death. So uh, he went to La Cabaña where Guevara was a director and uh, he was over, um, overlooking the, the execution. And the mother of the kid went to La Cabaña begging for his life and then said, Mr. Guevara, please, uh, my kid is here, he sent us to that and uh, please spare his life. I promise you that he, he'll never do something like that again. And he called his assistant, he thought that he had uh, saved his, his son's life. And he said, uh, look for this son of a lady uh, he's scheduled to be executed on, 
on Friday, execute him now, so she also had to wait. And she fainted, and he was executed. And that's the people. That was you know, on the Vinicio de Toro uh, movie. And that's not the only the only anecdote of Guevara killing minors. Oh yeah, he's got. I mean, there. I think there's books written about how horrible he was, and he like had a bloodlust. Um, he he really. Maybe he was. A, I don't. I know we're overusing the word or whatever, but like he certainly. Sorry. He's at least a sadist. He was at least a sadist. And he was um, open about it. Yeah, yeah. People. The thing is about um, like all these people rising up that shouldn't. The big part of the problem is I think there's so many people there. It's all. It's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of true. The idea that the people who are best. Um, personality-wise, to lead us, don't want those positions. They don't want to be pa powerful. That's not they, they don't they don't have that as a goal in their lives, which actually makes them more suited for the position because then they're probably not going to abuse it nearly half as much. And it's it's a joke, but it's also true. And because of that, people who want power get to run against other people who want power for the most part. So we don't have like you if you want to and, and I am I am seeing it more lately. If you want to prevent people like that from rising in the system without, you know, people standing against them, well, you have to do it. Like you like if you regardless of the fact that maybe this isn't what you want to do with your life, if you really want to stop it, you have to take part in it. And I, and that's kind of it, hard for a lot of people to do. Uh, who who's the first to stand up? Who's successfully standing up? Like there are a lot of people who are trying this and not being successful at it too, um, partially because they don't have like a lot of establishment backing, and that's making it hard too. So to me, I, I feel like it's uh, it's kind of snowballed at this point, and you kind of have to start locally, unfortunately, and I think that's where like school boards, city councilmen, I think that's where things are going to start to change for the better because people are starting to stand up and go, I'll take the spot. Um, and even though I don't want to do this, but this is what I need to do. Um, so I'm seeing that happen on the local level, but we're probably not going to see that on like larger levels successfully for, I don't know, like ever maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah and I People had a were going up. Go ahead. Go sorry. Ahead. People coming up the ladder reminds me of a military anecdote where the people that you don't want in your shop, you promote them so they can move on. It's called failing up in, in the corporate yeah. world, right? Like that's a thing. Um, they, they suck at their job. So, and for some reason you don't want to fire them. So you promote them and then they manage more people. Uh, like it, it's a thing. I had, I had a friend about 20 years ago who, um, who made this argument uh, back when phone books existed, I guess, um, that he, he seriously thought that uh, if politicians were chosen randomly from the phone book, uh, it would be much better system. And the, his rationale makes sense. First of all, you're less likely to get someone who's power hungry because you're choosing random. You're not, you're not choosing, you're not like self-selecting for power hungry people. And second of all, everyone would know that this is just some random dude. So they wouldn't want to give him a lot of power because he didn't like, there's no merit to his position. He's not smarter or better. He's just a random dude from the phone book. So they would be much more uh, careful with how much power they allotted to politicians. And I always thought that was a really interesting idea. I'm not endorsing it, but I just thought it, it, it is an interesting idea because it is a real problem. It self selects for um, yes. the worst people. Make it like yeah. very duty. It's Jury duty, there's you have power and you don't want to give it up, right? I mean, politician, yeah. but being in politics shouldn't be a career. It I, wasn't at the beginning of the nation either. But it's, I mean, all these people who are in politics are like, that's their career. And yes. the vast majority of them are extremely wealthy, became wealthy from being politicians, which makes you think, like, well, you know. That well, look at the the stock thing. We've seen this. Yeah. This has been uh, they the Congress w like way outperformed the market yeah. last year. You know what's going to happen? Well, so I, I mean, buy the stock before I'm insider trading. 
but it doesn't yeah, it's like, come on, guys. Yeah, we, yeah, we know. It. Yeah. And even people that like the right loves, uh, like who's the guy with the eye patch? What's his name? Crenshaw. Crenshaw. Um, yeah. Even Crenshaw, he had the, the audacity to say, well, I mean, we have to trade. Like, how are we supposed to get ahead in life? It's like, well, dude, you're not in Congress to get ahead in life. What the hell are you talking about? Like, it, the idea that you need to be able to trade, and it, it, it should disturb people that, I mean, Nancy Pelosi is the, the classic example, but it should disturb us all that the people in power outperform the market. That's, I mean, I, I don't, that's a smoking gun as far as I'm there should concerned. Be, there should be what they have in, in finance, supposedly. There's the fiduciary rule where everything you do has to be done in the best interest of others. You can't do it in your best interest, the fiduciary rule. But what is right? the best interest? Right. But but when so what fiduciary rule means is that you do not act in the best in something that benefits you. You have to act in a way that benefits the other party, what whoever that is. And that should be the same thing in politics. I mean, politicians should be based on some fiduciary. But I mean, like I Andrew's bring, saying, how do you define that? Though? How do you bring that in? Right. But by having you, a free market. But I think the, the whole point here is that markets are not free, are not free. It, are, they're freer in the United States. But there is a whole situation going on behind, and you know we can get in there. But uh, I think the the what do you call it? the um, stimulus? No, the incentives are ill placed because there's not there's not a market. There's a fake market, and uh, it's manipulated. And the, the if the market is not free, is a manip manipulate is a information transmitted by, by money is polluted, then it's not going to be coherent. And it's going to be a point like we have today that things doesn't make sense. Things don't make sense, make sense at all. In my opinion, the iceberg is behind. We already passed it. And we're going to see a sink at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, there's places here where it still you know, makes sense to live. Uh, I'm in LA. That's it. The people's That's Republic it. of California. <laughs> Wow. What? Maybe hopefully in the uh, Orange County. Uh, I, I think you're stuck with me, man. Is... California is we're 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 sinking, definitely. Uh but maybe Texas, maybe Carrie will save Texas or something. I don't know. Yeah, but everyone has to come through me because I I'm the I have the true possession <laughs> of the truth. <laughs> Florida. Florida is right. an interesting place. <laughs> okay. Uh I have a just really quickly we have super chat, so I was gonna read it. Ruben. We don't usually get super chats in book club. Thank you very much. Ruben Christopher Haynes gave us three super chats and says, the elite of all the world have commanded their twisted dominion to control, but will not control us for we are free. They've wanted to buy the U S Oh, they've wanted to buy us, but we will just not be bought. They want to destroy us, but we will give them the finger. We are the fellowship of free thinkers. We stand together to the end. Is that from Lord of the Rings? <laughs> it I sounds like, it. like it's from somewhere, but I like it. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, uh, this has been great, guys, but we've gone for two hours. Yeah. I'm kind of feeling like we should wrap up. Does it, is there any like final thoughts that someone really needs to get off their chest? I will say this, that when you're trying to look at people's motivations, the number, like including politicians, the number one motivation for all human beings is to expand their own happiness. I think it would yeah, be interesting. Unfortunately, unfortunately, some people get happy because they're sadists. So yes, and yeah. other people <laughs> they thrive on other people's unhappiness. So, and some of them run for governor. I anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good point. Thank you, thank you all for watching and for participating in book club. Uh, this was a fun one. I'm, I, I will admit, I first picked up the book and went, "Why did I push for this book?" But I got into it. And uh, and by the end, I was very happy that we did this book, and I hope you guys all enjoyed it. So, yeah. Carter, are we doing yeah. Anna Karenina or War and Peace next fiction? Oh, God, no. Yeah, that's just uh, – <laughs> I'll end up on the train track. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you we'll see you for, for joining us. tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.
Thanks for spending your time with us today. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes discussions with everyone from James Lindsay to Brett Weinstein. So go check it out. And please consider supporting the Unsafe Space team by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on a variety of social media platforms, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space Discord server, which is open to financial supporters at any level. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. Please download this updated list of contagious individuals. Use the hashtag GetBoosted to receive two complimentary Liberty Pellets. Mass formation psychosis is just a right-wing talking point. Please purge it from memory and resume your programming. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.